these are always things that that I think about. And every traffic stop to a police officer is an unknown. So you know, if I do pull a car over, you know, I've 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 not got a happy go lucky attitude because I don't know what I'm walking into. So my guard is always still up, and I'm I'm still always prepared for something to go bad if and when it does. But you can usually judge within the first 30 seconds of, of, of stopping someone what this person's demeanor is. And for me, I don't necessarily like to give, a, give somebody a ticket and know that now they're going to have to shell out 100 200 bucks for, the, for this ticket. So I have a philosophy of you're, nine times out of ten, you're going to write yourself your own ticket just based on the way that you interact with me because – I'm going to be cordial and I'm going to be very respectful of you unless you just start off right off the bat with an attitude um, or you're driving erratically or you're going to hurt somebody or you're just, you're, you know, you're acting like a speed demon or you're being reckless. You're generally not going to get a ticket. You're just going to get a warning from me. Um, because like I say, in, in this economy, most people are having a hard time putting, putting food on the table and getting the bills paid. And, you know, when, when I come home and I take off my uniform, I'm just like everybody else. You know, um, I have bills to pay, too. I have my own struggles just like everybody else. So, you know, it, you know I, I, I try to operate by the golden rule. Um, and I try to teach others to operate by that rule also. And now you're going to give away the secret of the century. How do you beat a traffic <clears throat> ticket in people? <laughs> People, this is why you're going to need your pencil and paper. It's our right to do exactly what Alex is going to tell you, how to beat any traffic ticket. And I think you can do that in 15 minutes, correct? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, let, let me preface that by saying that going back to the Constitution and the Bill of Rights and our forefathers and the men who wrote the Constitution were just brilliant men especially with those first 10 amendments. And, of course, the First Amendment, the freedom of speech, religion, expression, uh, the right to redress grievances, that's, that's awesome. The Second Amendment, of course, is a great amendment. I wish we could go back in time and say, hey, can you reword this a little differently? Because <laughs> right now there's people who think that just the militia can carry guns. So I would want them to rewrite the Second Amendment a little more solid. And um, fit the future. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then, of course, the Fourth Amendment, you know, everyone should be secure in their effects and papers from unreasonable searches and seizures. That's great, too. But another one that a lot of people forget is the Fifth Amendment. Now, what is the Fifth Amendment? The Fifth Amendment is that gives us a right not to incriminate ourselves, which is why we have the Miranda ruling, 19, uh, the 1964 ruling that's when police officers will read you your rights. You know, you have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be held against you in a court of law. People forget that how important that Fifth Amendment is. So I'm going to preface this by saying, if at all possible, never, ever talk to the police. <laughs> and it's be, because it's your right. Because talking to the police, even if you're completely innocent, can still potentially get you in a lot of trouble. Now, that's not to say that you should be mean to the police or cuss out the police, um, although I, technically that is your First Amendment right. As little interaction with the police as you can. Just like going back to when I was saying that, you know, if a police officer asks you to identify yourself and he's got no reason to, he's got no probable cause, you've not committed a crime, then you just respectfully say, if I'm not being detained and I'm not committed a crime, I'd like to be free to go, please. And again, I can't, I can't vouch for every police officer how they're going to react, but generally, from what I've seen, police officers will say, okay, you're fine. It's fine. You're free to go. So, yeah, you want as little interaction with the police as you can. And, you know, there's a lot of videos on, on YouTube who people intentionally who are recording their interactions with the, with the police to to get a rise out of them or to exercise their rights. One of the big ones is, you know, am I am I free to leave? Am I being detained? And generally, like I said, a police officer will eventually say, well, you know, realize that he has no right to keep you. So he'll he'll let you go. You know, a lot of people, when they get stopped by the police or, or some people, I won't say a lot, but, you know, some people will, you know, they'll want to exercise that kind of attitude. You know, uh, if a, yeah, I pulled you over because you were doing, OK, well, have I committed a crime? Am I under arrest? Well, no, sir, you're not under arrest. You were you were speeding. You were going, you know, 55 and a 35. Um, OK, but uh, have I injured anybody? You know, who's who's the victim? Was anybody hurt? Did I damage someone's property? No, sir. 
so I'm not committed to crime and I am I free to go? And you can get in those arguments if if you want to, but like I said, I advise against it. But if you're if you're stopped by a police officer and he does give you a ticket, it's it's just best not to argue. Just go ahead and accept the ticket because you can get out of that ticket. And the way you do that, and we can talk about this a little later too if we have time, is that you know when I say and you ask a police officer, have I committed a crime? If you're speeding, you technically haven't committed a crime. What you've done is you violated a statute. But more importantly, you violated a corporate statute because all of our so-called laws and all of our infractions and everything, they're actually now under the Uniform Commercial Code, which is under a corporate act. So a police officer is, in effect, working for a corporation. And the way that you can prove this is go to Dun & Bradstreet. Dun & Bradstreet is the company that assigns credit ratings to all businesses and corporations. So Apple Computer could have a triple A-plus rating with, with Dun & Bradstreet. Look up your state. Say you live in the state of Rhode Island. Look up Rhode Island on Dun & Bradstreet, and you will see that Rhode Island is a corporation. But then start going through the different agencies within Rhode Island. Look up Rhode Island State Police. You'll see that Rhode Island State Police is a corporation within the corporation of Rhode Island. So everything's under UCC code. And because everything is corporate and everything is under the UCC code, that ticket that you've just gotten from that officer, what you're doing by accepting that ticket is you're granting your consent to that officer to accept that ticket. So it's a contract. So basically, so what you in effect have done is you've agreed to contract with that state and with that police department. So police officer stops you. He says, you know, I stopped you because you were speeding. You're going 35 or you're going 55 in, in a 35. Here's your ticket. So you accept the ticket. Now what do you do? Okay, well, you can either pay it or you can go to court. Or the third option is you don't have to pay it. So here's what you do. So the officer gives you this ticket. Now, because we're under UCC, Uniform Commercial Code, and everything's a corporation, we are bound by what's called the Truth in Lending Act. So say you go and buy a home or something like that, and you've signed all your paperwork and everything, and then you start talking it over with your wife that night, and you say to each other, you know, we probably shouldn't have bought this. We probably shouldn't have done this. Well, the Truth in Lending Act, because it's a corporate statute, allows you three business days, uh, $72 or three business days, to, in effect, cancel, cancel that contract. It's kind of like a buyer's remorse kind of thing. The corporate statutes give you that three-day window, that 72-hour window, to cancel that contract. So what you've done when you've accepted your speeding ticket is you've contracted. So what you do is you want to cancel that contract. So the Federal Truth in Lending Act provides that any party to a contract may rescind his consent because that's what you've done. You've consented within three business days of entering into that contract. So what you do is you take your citation or your speeding ticket and you write across the face of that ticket in bold print, blue or black ink, in big bold letters, I do not accept this offer to contract, and I do not consent to these proceedings. Okay, so sign your signature underneath, and you want to have this notarized as well. So you might want to draw up a paper um, along with the citation um, saying that, you know, under the Federal Truth in Lending Act, this, you know, I have granted my consent because this is a corporate statute and everything is under UCC rule and that you do not accept this offer to contract or these proceedings. So you make sure that you have that notarized. And then right above your signature, you write without prejudice, comma, UCC 1 dash. Three zero eight. Now, what that does is the. I'm going to give you the short story of that. Well, un, under UCC code, you, it, it's basically your. Uh, what's the best way to explain this without actually having to go to the UCC code book? It's basically relieving you of your burden as as your straw man. And I don't know if your listeners know what a straw man is. Basically, through your birth certificate, you are an all caps, all capital letters straw person. So when you sign your lowercase name, you are signing your flesh and blood name. So by writing UCC-1-308, you're acknowledging that you're only signing this as your corporate straw man, but as a flesh and blood person, you want to be recognized as such. So 
you write and make, make sure you write it above. Don't write it below because there's a chance that they can take scissors and cut that off and it won't be on there. So you send this in. You haven't notarized. You send it in it certified. You have to send it certified mail because that way you have proof that somebody got a copy of it because they can always say, well, we never got that. But if you send it certified mail, then they've obviously got a copy of it. So you serve this, the, that canceled citation that, you, that you've just voided. You send it back to your county clerk or whoever does your traffic tickets uh, with a certificate of service from, from, from the post office. So you get it in, in return mail. And the reason you want to have it notarized is because not too many people realize this, but a notary republic is technically a, a deputy secretary of state. And uh, a deputy secretary of state has more clout and more power than just a simple court clerk. So that's why you want to have that notarized. So that's basically how you get out of a traffic ticket. Now, you may – most judges, when they see this, are going to abide by it because they know when you, if you do happen to go to court, you're going to be able to prove that everything is under com, uh, uniform commercial code. So generally, they're just going to forgive the ticket. They're going to say, oh, this person knows what they're doing. It's the same with red light cameras. If you've ever got a, uh, a, a speeding ticket from one of those red light cameras, it takes a picture of your license plate and it sends you it, – you know, it, it, it sends it to you um, in the mail. And all, of you, and all of a sudden, now you've got – a ticket that you knew nothing about because you weren't stopped by a cop. It's just a, this camera snapped a photo of, of not necessarily even your license plate, just a license plate. So they're actually giving the citation to the car is what they're giving it to another another straw person. So you, and so you can do the same thing with with the red light tickets. You know, ask them. Uh, in the case of the red light tickets, you do the same thing. You you put the cancellation on it, say, I do not wish to contract, and I do not consent to these proceedings. And also, please send me, any, uh, send me any and all documentation that contains my original signature stating that I agreed to these red light cameras. And, of course, they can't do that. Yes. Um, so The most yeah. important thing is when you're standing, when you're seated in front of the judge – how do you not stand when he asks you or not answer your name? These are very important facts because you will find yourself in front of a judge who's going to get you because you know what you know. Yeah, and that's and that's the thing. At all costs, what you absolutely want to do is avoid going to court because unless you know exactly what you're doing and exactly what what to say, you're almost always going to lose in court because they'll get you under their jurisdiction. You know, there's an under. You know, when they say, "Do you understand?" That means, "Do you stand under our our control and and our power?" And if you say, "Yes, I understand," then that then then boom, they've got you. What you don't want to do is be belligerent when you go to court. Uh, you don't want to be defiant. You don't want to refuse to answer questions. Uh, you, you don't want to be disrespectful to the judge because you'll find yourself being thrown in jail for contempt of court. But usually, almost every time you go to court, a bailiff or sometimes even the judge them, themselves will come out and, and they'll say, all rise. Now, they don't come out and say, okay, everybody has to stand up. It's mandatory. Get up. They just come in and they say, all rise. It's not a command. It's just, it's just a request. What they're doing is the bailiff or the judge is simply asking for your consent. And that's where this all comes down to. We're consenting to all of these things. So what we have to do is learn not to consent. Um, we have to learn to say no. But we have to do it correctly and we have to do it uh, cordially and, and politely. What you don't want to do is go into court and be belligerent to to the judge's court. So if you go into court and the bailiff says, please rise, and you stay seated. Now, sometimes if the courtroom is really packed, they, will, they might not notice one person not standing up. But generally they will because the bailiff looks around and makes sure every, everybody's standing. So the judge will come out and the, and the judge will say, please, sir, please stand. So don't refuse to stand. What you want to do is you want to stay seated and you want to say, I shall stand, Your Honor. However, I surrender no common law rights, nor do I agree to impersonum jurisdiction. Usually <laughs> a judge will say, uh-oh, I've got somebody who knows what they're doing. And a lot of times they'll, they'll, they'll say this three times. And after three times, they'll usually, especially if it's a, if it's a civil court case, it's it's going to go a little differently if you're actually in a criminal court and in a criminal trial. There's completely different rules. But generally, they'll, they'll know what you're doing. And if the judge agrees with you and the judge says, okay, I agree that you're not serving your common law rights and I have no 
impersonum jurisdiction over you. Because when you grant jur- uh, impersonum jurisdiction over you, he's that judge has got you, that court has got you, you're now at their mercy, and they can pretty much do anything that they want. 